Hello, everyone. Today, I am really excited to share with you a very special guest. Her name is Joey Remini, and she is a specialist with tinnitus and vertigo and dizziness. And one of the things that I really love about her is she provides this step-by-step -step approach to learning how you can use neuroplasticity to heal your body and to use your body's own natural wisdom. So thank you so much, Joey. Thank you for joining us. It's so great to be here. So hello from Australia. Yeah, that's so cool. I love, I love, okay, as much as people hate Zoom, like I love that we can do this. Like I love that we can talk all the way across the world. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Now, um, you are a vestibular audiologist, right? Mm -hmm. You specialize in these conditions like tinnitus, vertigo, um, dizziness, and things like that. But it sounds to me like you have a really unique approach to, to working with these conditions. Now, now, I've heard a lot of people say that tinnitus is like not treatable. Would you agree with that? <laughs> no, it makes my heart really heavy. It's, it's a tragedy, really, that that kind of myth has traveled this far for this long, but um, I mean, I've just written a book and the reason for that was to try and really debunk some of those myths and help use science to explain why this is what we can do about it. And this is why we can reverse it. And this is why so many people return back to normal and tinnitus can be forever and people can live with it for their whole lives, but that's if they're caught in a chronic loop neurologically and they're never educated how to reverse that or break that loop. So it can feel incurable and lonely and devastating and helpless and hopeless and all of those things are true, but it doesn't need to be that way. And I feel like medically, doctors, neurologists, ear, nose and throat surgeons, audiologists, psychologists, physiotherapists, a lot of our go-to people who we, we, we ask support for and they're experts and we trust them, a lot of those people have been saying, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do, you're going to have to live with it. There's truth and there's nothing they can do. And me as a vestibular audiologist, I can't remove your tinnitus, but I can teach you how to do that yourself. And I really hope, my dream is that in 10 years time, this conversation will be normal and people will be told, oh yeah, you can reverse your tinnitus. Like I can't do it for you, but it's possible. Like get these resources, get this education, find your path. That's what I'm hoping will be the new story. That is such a wonderful dream. And I feel like it meshes really well with what I'm trying to do as well with therapy, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of people, I just got an email from someone today who said, hey, I'm working with these fancy doctors in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, I said, is there anything I can do to work on my anxiety other than medication? And the doctors were like, nope, sorry, that's it. That's your only option. It's a brain chemistry issue. And there's nothing else you can do. And she said, you know, Emma, I've been watching some of your videos and I'm realizing there, there are some other tools out there. And for me, I was just like, so sad. <laughs> like, I was so sad <laughs> that so many people get told that their brain is just stuck. Yeah. And that's it, like, yeah. It, it couldn't be further from the truth. However, I do believe that <clears throat> these professionals are doing the best they can with the yeah. education they have, with the training yeah. they have, with the resources they have, but also with, to a certain extent, their personal life experience. <clears throat> and um, my, my kind of comment there to listeners would be, be very careful who you ask advice from. Always be discerning and, and really know that you're the expert in you and the way your brain organises itself and the way your neurals, neuron pathways and neural networks create their patterns and create <clears throat> um, this kind of spider web effect and it doesn't matter how fancy a doctor's post nominals are or how many years of experience they have or how you know how great they are at surgery for example none of that makes them the expert in your healing process with neuroplasticity it's, just, it's and this is where i think a lot of people give their power away they'll go to an excellent surgeon and expect that surgeon to give them the most accurate information when actually they're good at surgery. Ask them about surgery, right? That's mm -hmm. their expertise. Don't ask them about healing your tinnitus or vertigo because they have zero training in that. It's just, that's not what it's about for them. So mm -hmm. I guess it's, and, and actually my book covers this, it's use experts for what they're experts in. Mm. Don't ask some questions that you can better answer yourself. And this would be things like, how do I heal? Well, actually you answer that better than me. Mm-hmm. 
I love that. That's that's such a that's such an important perspective, because and and just like if someone came to me asking for advice about medication, I would say speak with your doctor about that, right? Like I don't know. I've I've taken courses on medication, but that's not my specialty, right? And oh. and your specialty is using neuroplasticity yeah. to treat these conditions, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I've I've kind of become a specialist in how to implement neuroplasticity and the mm -hmm. education around getting people to understand what do I feel right now in my present body and this could be really uncomfortable sounds and sensations that I don't want to hear or feel and actually mm -hmm. sensations come from any of our senses you know nose mm -hmm. eyes ears touch tongue all of that but I've um, specialized really in the ears and the ears communicate directly with the eyes so mm -hmm. a lot of my clients have visual disturbance spotting dotting vortexes as well as spinning or push pull feelings that kind of drunken foggy um hangover dizziness that's that's vertigo in a sense and then tinnitus sounds are anything we hear in our body or our ears that nobody else can hear because they're sounds generated by our body and so sure. my clients are uncomfortable they're often anxious about it they're often feeling helpless hopeless powerless being told there's no cure being told they've got to live with it or they're spending lots of money on generic prescribed home exercises diets supplements medications devices and so they're over it. And my specialty has been to teach them how to say, okay, well, what am I noticing and feeling and sensing both emotionally and in my symptom, symptomatology? How can I support that physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually and meet it and let my brain really process that data calmly and quietly? And then what do I want to feel? Not what don't I want to feel, which, which we can talk about, that's a trap. What do I want to feel? Let's say I want to feel peace and courage. Mm -hmm. What can I do? What, how can I cultivate my neural patterns of feeling inner peace and feeling courageous? So how can I move from A to B, from what I'm feeling now to where I want to feel? Neuroplasticity is closing that gap. And there's an education mm -hmm. component of learning how to do that. Because, mm -hmm. of course, as, a, as Joey Remini, the expert, I don't know what you feel right now. And I don't know what you want to feel right now. And I don't know how you close that gap. All of that is a personal self-study inquiry that involves a willingness and a humility and a kindness and compassion from the person going through it doesn't matter how expert i am the person going through the healing has to take those steps and i think really needs a support team that understands neuroplasticity to hold them in that learning phase and space um so yes that's why i've kind of developed the resources i developed yeah. So like, so you, you work with people to foster their innate healing capabilities, their deep wisdom to really yeah. lean in to this, the, these, these sensations or these uncomfortable situations and, and, and to get where they want to get. Yeah, totally. And, and, you know, it's normal to have tinnitus from time to time. It's even normal to have dizziness from time to time. And the research is suggesting that there's a full spectrum of persistent dizziness and some people are debilitated by it, can't drive, can't pick up their children like it's absolutely devastating other people get this persistent dizzy not quite right feeling and they're, they're perfectly they don't care they just carry on yeah. so there's a full spectrum and all of it's kind of falls within normal limits but for people who get um i would call it abnormalized like for whatever reason their investigation process has abnormalized them so they feel crazy they feel like there's something wrong with themselves there's nothing wrong yeah. with you if you feel this constant fog like a brain mm -hmm. bruise. There's nothing wrong with you. It's actually your brain is working overtime to figure out why you're feeling what you're feeling. And it's kind of fighting itself. It's living in an inner conflict. It's a sensory conflict where what you feel doesn't match what you see or what you hear doesn't match what you think you should hear. And mm -hmm. this sensory conflict is totally exhausting and depleting. It zaps us of our vitality, of our inner faith in ourselves. We end yeah. up with self-doubt, body image issues, anxiety, depression, isolation, you name it. It's an awful cascade of very predictable events, all of which are pre preventable, all of which are reversible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's really key actually to, to note that what I'm seeing in my clients who are going through what I call the rock steady healing process with neuroplasticity is these improvements, the symptom reduction or um, resolution, we're seeing it regardless of people's age, regardless of their gender, regardless of their diagnoses or lack of diagnoses. And some people never get a diagnosis, which is frustrating, but it's okay. 
And regardless of time since onset of symptoms, so even if they've had 10, 20, 30 years of symptoms, they can still reverse it. And this is that innate healing power Emma's talking about. We can heal. We just need to support the body to initiate that and have the capacity to problem solve that neural adaptability. And a lot of that means identifying where we're stuck and where we're looped and finding ways yeah. to break the loop and then create new circuits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense to me. So when I hear you talking about a loop, like one of the first examples that comes to my mind is like someone with uh, OCD. So if someone has these intrusive thoughts, right, they might have a thought, uh, maybe a sexual thought or a thought that they need to check the front door to see if it's been locked and they have this thought and then they are like, what's the matter with me? Why did I have this thought? Like, what, what's, what's going on with me? What's, this needs to go away. I need to make this thought go away. I shouldn't be thinking that. And then they start cycling and spiraling in their head. And then pretty soon they get locked into these patterns of making it go away. Is that kind of what you're describing? Like with, with so, these symptoms? Yeah, there will definitely be overlaps. And there's also overlaps in the world of chronic pain and healing chronic pain. Because mm -hmm. we get very hypervigilant yeah. about... And actually, a lot of OCD people have chronic vertigo and chronic tinnitus because they become obsessive compulsive about the symptom. And mm -hmm. there's a hypervigilance where they'll check on it three times a moment. Is it mm -hmm. still there? Is it still there? Is it still there? And like one of the most important parts of healing it is not trying to get rid of it anymore and not caring if it's there or not. And that really, mm -hmm. for me, is the ultimate sign that someone has healed is whether these sensations come or go. A, they don't call them symptoms anymore. They become very welcome passing sensations that just add color and variety to a person's lived experience so they're no longer seen as abnormal and whether mm. they come or go or not is not a concern or a worry we're not looking for them we're not searching for them we're not trying to get rid of them it really is just I'm I'm allowing myself to meet myself in my full humanness and that sometimes means my ugly icky sticky messy bits I'm willing to feel that without judgment mm -hmm. and I'm also open to my orgasmic blissful joyful pleasurable bits so I'm not mm -hmm. numbing, I'm not cherry picking the nice bits and then numbing, denying, distracting, medicating the nasty bits. I'm actually open to the full human spectrum, which mm -hmm. I cover in my book because I feel like that is such an important conversation in for all modern humans. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, we need to learn how to feel again because often we're just taught to pucker up and smile and don't cry and don't whinge and don't just, just get on with it, push through. And don't feel are, sad just feel happy you should yeah. you should feel happy all the time or whatever right yeah and that doesn't work because from a neuroplasticity mm -hmm. perspective in fact I, I share this example in my book of having chronic sadness and I won't call it depression because it was it was a chronic sadness after my brother broke his neck skiing he became a quadriplegic and it was mm -hmm. four years of me being cheerful and strong for my family and having a neuroplasticity background, you know, really being a bit of a coach for my brother saying, don't listen to the doctors, you know, we don't know your outcomes. We don't know what your body's capable of. Um, mm -hmm. And he has since really surprised people with what he's capable of doing with his spinal injury. Yeah. He seemed to get acceptance and get his sense of self back quicker than I did. He was dating, he was getting married, he was studying. Four years down, I was like struggling to eat. I was just so, my inner world was a mess. I had suppressed mm -hmm. all of my feelings of sadness, pretended I was happy and told mm -hmm. myself, well, I've got working arms and legs, so I should be happy, right? I should just get on with it. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. It, it got to this point where like I, I was, I was I just kind of couldn't eat anymore. Like I was just completely look like this on the inside. Mm -hmm. And my inner wisdom finally came through and was like, Joey, you're allowed to be sad. Your, your brother's never going to be the same again. You've never let this sadness be felt and processed. And now you've like got this overlog of sadness neurochemicals floating around your body and you have to do something with them. You've got to feel them. Feel them as long as it takes. Like let yourself cry, let yourself go there. And I just kind of let all the, the feeling of sadness come through me with this mm -hmm. deep compassion and acceptance and like reality. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing was, is it passed really quickly. Like once I let it pass, it was like this miraculous, like, poof. And then like, I felt myself come home. It was like a big, huge software update on a computer. Mm -hmm. And so it, what I'm saying here is we can't suppress feelings forever. A little bit's fine and it's kind of neuroprotective, but in the long run, we have to actually update ourselves with our present reality, feel what we need to feel, let those brain chemicals flush and move because at the end of sadness often comes relief. 
And we can't feel that relief and that joy and love and connection or compassion unless we feel the sadness. We can't skip the sadness, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's just kind of a little example of how it, it can be neurologically really quite destructive and difficult and debilitating to suppress what we're feeling. And mm -hmm. that emotional suppression or um, even shyness or being afraid of feeling or judging ourselves or feeling embarrassed or feeling what we feel, that can really impact the sounds our body makes and mm -hmm. the senses that we feel and the sensory conflict and sensory distortions because it won't be of surprise to people that in that four year period of my life, I had the most vertigo and tinnitus ever. Mm. So my inner mm -hmm. world was yep. just completely out of balance. And that was really what inspired me to become so passionate about this topic. Yeah, and I, I wanna hear a little bit more about your story and your experience with that, but I, I gotta go back to this because that's so, in my mind, like so key, this idea, you know, no one wants to feel anxiety or sadness or depression or, or whatever it is. Um, but when we resist or compress or suppress those thoughts, it tends to make them worse and they get stuck in us. And there's something like, uh, there's something about like, feeling them fully and embracing them that lets them move through you much of the time, right? Yeah, and I, I talk about this in the book because when we resist them, mm -hmm. we're, we're actually telling the brain, so we're, in, we're basically the CEO of our inner world. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're telling our brain what's important, what's not important, you know, which, which guys and girls are spunky and sexy. And, you know, like we're, we're on the lookout all the time. And this is part of our survival mechanisms as human beings. And, a, and anxiety is actually what's kept us safe and has protected us from safe yeah. tigers and violence. So it has a healthy place. Mm -hmm. But what we need to do when we take control and take power back of our inner world, we need to actually teach the brain that those tinnitus noises or those sadness feelings or those vertigo and dizziness feelings or anxiety feelings, they're all normal and safe. They're false alarms. They're not true um, life-threatening situations or triggers. And when we're resisting and fighting them, I'll just use the example of tinnitus. Mm -hmm. The same goes for dizziness. If I wake up every day and like, oh my God, is it there? Is it there? Is it there? Okay, I've got to take my pill. I've got to use my device. I've got to talk about it. I've got to tell my friends. I've got to go to a doctor. I've got to book another appointment. All of those behaviors and thoughts and words are telling the brain, this is super abnormal. It's a problem, right? Your brain mm -hmm. doesn't actually speak English. So all the brain gets is, Joey wants to focus on this. She loves her tinnitus. I'm going to help her out and put more neural power there and make it louder so she can hear it better because she's really into this tinnitus. It's like all she's thinking about. So if Joey mm -hmm. wants to hear it, I'll help her. More neural allocation over there. Let's make it louder. So my brain helps me to focus on it by making more of it. Right. Uh -huh. so when we resist something and put emotional allocation into it, which is often fear and hatred. Mm hmm the brain responds by going you're super into that so i'll give it more neural energy mm -hmm. and if we reverse that to it's no big deal whatever i'm i'm super neutral about it i have no emotion attached to it the brain's like meh she's not interested so i'm not going to put more neural activity there i'll put no, more neural activity to where joey's focusing which might be connecting to her friends and creating a new band she wants to make a new band so i'm going to start putting all my neural emphasis onto finding musicians so mm -hmm. like we teach our brain what to emphasize and what to make louder. And that mm -hmm. I often say to my OCD clients, use it. Like having an obsessive compulsive tendency can be used for incredibly helpful outcomes if we start oh. focusing obsessively on calm or peace or love or connection, whatever is your new normal, which is the title of the last chapter in my book, we're, we're moving towards to building a new normal. That's where we want to go. Yeah. If I know my new normal is to feel relaxed in my body, to feel at peace in myself, to feel emotional regulation, we can obsess over that and make that our focus and your brain will actually respond. It will give you more of that because that's what you're focusing on. Well, and that's like, it shouldn't be, but this is like a revolutionary concept because you're trying to say this in a world that says, if something's uncomfortable, avoid it, distract it, or fight it right like just don't think yeah. about it watch more tv like whatever right yeah totally and this is all in the yoga sutras so my background my university background is psychology neuroscience and vestibular audiology which is a fancy term for the little tiny balance organs in the ear 
I geeked yeah. out and studied all of that in super detail. But my initial, my first love and my first profession is yoga. Mm -hmm. I have 21, experience, 21 years experience in yoga. Yoga is the heart of neuroplasticity. It's the experiential practice of repetition and openness and observation and non-judgment. So many therapies, acceptance, commitment therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, so many therapies are based on yoga principles. Mm -hmm. And if you go back into the yoga sutras, which is kind of like the, um, the manual of yoga, apparently 4,000 years old. So it would have started orally and then somebody wrote it down, Patanjali supposedly, but no one really knows. He talks about, this is thousands of years ago, millennia, he talks about avoidance. We are wired to avoid pain. We're wired to avoid discomfort and we're wired to crave and seek, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll and pleasure. And so right, yeah, yeah. a huge part of yoga is developing equanimity and to not be kind of victim to circumstance to what our sensory world is bombarding us with. And this is like when, when, when I did go to India to, for, uh, after I'd completed my yoga studies and training as a teacher and went to India for cultural immersion. I mean, in many ways, I can see why some of this started in India because of the noises and the smells. And it's like, it is a little bit of a sensory, like pollution, contamination, confronting busyness. And you almost need to be able to let it go and find your inner peace and find your humor and find your joy with all of this bombarding confronting stimuli and that's really mm -hmm. what meditation and yoga is about it's finding stillness within even if there is chaos without or around um anyway i, I can talk forever on these topics but yes yeah. <laughs> well it's cool yeah I, I i i think the these ancient these people who practiced yoga for thousands of years they they have so much wisdom i mean like just now right for example with trauma um this this guy stephen Por porches is coming out with um the polyvagal theory right he's, oh my goodness your vagal nerve is really important and one of the ways you can trigger that is by softening your eyes and softening your gaze and it's like well how long have the yogis been doing that like oh yeah that and like years. and like vocalizing like mm -hmm. an exhalation with a sigh you know it's an arm oh. <laughs> yep yep um, totally and it, and and like scientists now neuroscientists can say well that is probably triggering that vagal nerve to trigger that parasympathetic response yeah but the yogis have been doing it for and also when we when we do come to our breath and i teach the most basic 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 breath exercises because as an asthmatic i really understand how the breath can trigger anxiety so we have to mm -hmm. be really sensitive to that but noticing our normal breath so not pushing not forcing not changing just noticing the normal breath will can have really quite surprising outcomes it's like a very simple yoga practice but it can bring us into a place of being open to receiving what comes, not judging, changing our relationship to our body, being really dynamic with how we observe ourselves without judgment. That's a, that's a really key piece. And then from the science, um, when we do notice our breath and bring that conscious awareness to breath, we, we actually do tend to slow down without trying. It naturally slows down. It naturally yeah. becomes yeah. more rhythmic. And then we get some like soft muscle um, involvement around the lungs and apparently that stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system and so a lot of these very ancient basic simple practices are helping mm -hmm. break those chronic stress loops which inhibit neuroplasticity we're not going to problem solve a new neural network while a tiger is chasing us right when That's we're right. stressed <laughs> and in modern day situations that could be like oh my god i can't find the right shoes for this outfit or you know i've got to have this awkward conversation with my best friend or, you know, right. my partner's doing this and it's annoying me. So stress is generally not life-threatening, but our body goes into that old biological space of, okay, stop all digestion and repair and neuroplasticity. And let's just look for the threat. Like, let's just pause everything yep. and wait for that tiger in the bushes somewhere, right? Because it's somewhere. So it's about interrupting those stress loops, having strategies and a toolkit to activate the parasympathetic rest, repair, digested neuroplasticity problem solving system. And my clients are learning how to do that for themselves in real time. So it doesn't matter what situation arises on any day of the week, any time of night, they know how to go from that chronic stress loop back into the calm, rest, digest, heal, peace, calm, relaxed space. And that can mm -hmm. take some people a year to learn. Like it's not necessarily going to happen like this. Um, some people pick it up quickly, other people take time, but it is that education of going, well, how do I get from A to B? Because not everybody's the same. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk real quickly, just 
like neuroplasticity is a process, right? It, it mm -hmm. takes time. It's not quick. Um, so can you uh, boil it down in one minute or less? No, <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, no, well, first of all, it can be quick. When there's high yeah. emotion, we can okay. get incredible, which, which is why things like birthing a baby can have such healing impacts that can do more yeah. than 20 years of therapy because it's just the emotional stakes are so massive. And also mm -hmm. from a trauma point of view, when mm -hmm. we have a, a, an impactful trauma, that's high emotion, that can scar us in an instant for life. That's mm -hmm. neuroplasticity as well. It's not... Uh, it's not where we want to go, but it's just an example of how neural patterns, you know, if that thing happened to me and I was traumatized, that can make me feel like I'm unworthy and not good enough and ashamed for the rest of my life. That's a neural patterning that's implanted. Yeah, it, it creates an impression on your brain very quickly. That's a very, um, very deep impression, right? Yeah. So we can heal quickly, but the, the idea is that we have to have that high emotion. So the amount of emotional um, input the more kind of neurological kickback you get and mm -hmm. because we're looking at making conscious healing neuroplasticity changes the kind of emotions we're looking for is celebration self-reassurance self-acceptance mm. self-compassion we want those emotions to be just blissing out okay. because that means we've got more dopamine more oxytocin more of that yummy juicy brain chemistry that gives us more bang for our buck right mm -hmm. so yeah yeah so, but basically your neurons communicate kind of like fingertips and two arms. They're passing messages. I've got my baby's little toy here. Neuro, okay. neurotransmitter chemicals are moving from one neuron to the next. They're captured by receptors. And if there's enough of that message, it will carry on to the next neuron. And you'll have messages moving up and down your body all day long with these little chemicals passing between them. The more neurons pass messages, the better they get at it. And mm -hmm. so for my clients who don't feel normal anymore and they feel completely abnormal and sick and dizzy and full of tinnitus, um, they need to rebuild normal neural networks by teaching the neurons to pass the normal feeling neurochemicals from neuron to neuron with more synchronicity, with more frequency, with more intensity, with more duration. Mm -hmm. So they can hardwire it and then that new normal becomes their automated resting state. They no longer need to put effort in, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you might say, what does that look like? Well, instead of focusing on getting rid of the dizziness, tinnitus or anxiety, et cetera, they mm -hmm. first of all, step one would be identify what you want to feel. What are your desired sensations to feel normal? Not what you don't want to feel, which you know is easy, but that'll keep you yeah. stuck. So common ones are to feel calm, relaxed, confident, adventurous, enthusiastic. Like people often lose their vigor for life. They're like, I just want yeah, to feel like Yeah, I want to feel like I wake up in the day and I'm actually excited about what's going to happen that's for them might be feeling normal. So they have to figure out how to get those excitement neurons going. So their therapy practice or their rock steady toolkit would be what things could I do to help me feel genuinely excited to release those neural messages, right? So then that becomes their home practice. And with time, frequency, repetition, and with all of these emotional regulation tools to make sure they don't kind of, kind of go backwards into the old chronic loops, mm -hmm. they return to normal. And neuroplasticity, is something we are born with. The human brain has billions of neurons, trillions of synaptic connections, so much adaptability, redundancy, and robustness. I think most people, myself included, we don't realize how powerful we are. We don't realize how much we can co-create the inner world we're living in and our perception of the world. And we often just sit back with the status quo and be the person we think we should be and kind of live this mm -hmm. numbed out life of good enough or Am I good enough? Question mark. And I think neuroplasticity enables us to really understand who am I authentically on this planet? What are my values? How can I how can I align to those? How can I be the best version of me on the planet, connect to community and have great cascade impact on this earth? It's like really going beyond the individual and into the collective. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of my clients start feeling victims of their sensations and come out the other side really wanting to give back to the planet. It's quite amazing. It's quite remarkable. That's really cool. I love that. I, I, so, so you start, if you want to change your brain, you start by paying attention to what you want to be feeling or what you want to be doing with your life. What brings you joy? Um, and, and so when I think about like, what would be the interactions or what would be like the, to break that down day to day, what would that look like for some people? I, you tell me if I'm right on this, like, are you talking about things like, like gratitude practice or trying to find 
something beautiful in the world that you can notice? Like, how do you, how do you take, if, if you've been feeling sad or if you've been feeling depressed or if you've been really hyper-focusing on your tinnitus, like how do you practically in like one example shift from focusing on the negative yeah. to that brain that you want? Well, because a lot of it's coming through the body, it's actually a sensory discomfort. Mm. solution comes through the body too so what and i want to talk about that right so you've got these uncomfortable sensations maybe we'll come back to sorry i'm already like but like what do we do with uncomfortable sensations but let's is, i think i think i'm going to answer yeah. your question in this anyway um because yeah. what i want to start with is just by directly addressing gratitude practices are awesome and looking for joy are awesome but we're often not ready to do that and there's very yeah. long impact when we don't like what we're feeling in our body. It just it, it just becomes like, I just wanna please my therapist. They told me to do this gratitude list. So here we go. Uh -huh. Like it, it's, it's not that impactful because there's not that readiness. So mm -hmm. that is part of the Rock City process. And I use those, but they're way down the line. They're like module four. Which yeah, is, yeah, okay. They're, they're already months into there. So it's not to start with, no. So to start with, it's about body scanning, which is the core basic yoga practice of noticing, sensing, and feeling without judgment, with curiosity, mm. being yeah. present in the body and learning to accept the sensations that come and go without judgment, which means we're no longer moving into that avoidance or craving. We're just saying, oh, okay, welcome tinnitus and welcome mm. sticky armpit and welcome clammy <laughs> hands and welcome pumping heart. And, oh, that's nice. I can feel my heels on the floor. And oh, now I'm connecting to my sitting bones on the chair. And now I, for me right now, I can feel the wall against my back. It's kind of a nice feeling. So what happens mm -hmm. here is we're staying in the body. We're not abandoning the body. And we're actually teaching the brain, all right, these dizzy and tinnitus signals and these anxiety signals are not everything. They're actually mm -hmm. one millionth of my experience right now because I also have this tingling sensation on my hair follicles. And I also have a lovely sense of touch on my fingertips. Mm -hmm. and et cetera and so on so we get better at noticing more of what's in the body without over emphasizing what we don't want we we become more open to feeling and sensing now if you think about that from a neuroplasticity point of view the brain's a little bit like a computer could be like a metaphor analogy and as we notice sensations it's like data is coming up and being processed by the computer when we numb it, medicate it, deny it, distract it, avoid it, that data is blocked, okay? The brain's just up there going dizziness, tinnitus, anxiety, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. It's not getting any other input, it's blocked because we're medicated or we're ignoring it or whatever, we're judging it. Yeah. In order for the brain to recategorize and normalize the tinnitus and dizziness, because what we want to do is not actually get rid of it because they actually, those neural firing patterns of sounds in our body and dizziness sensations are actually normal. We don't want to kill those neurons. What we want to do is to make them quieter and less important. We want to tell the brain, we don't need these. They're not helping mm -hmm. me make friends. They're not helping me do my work. They're not helping me mm -hmm. be an aligned, conscious human. They're actually just error signals. So we want to give the body more signals that we can focus on, more signals that we can use. And by default, the symptomatology, the sensations that are, are not needed become quieter because the brain stops allocating resource to them. Right, so the solution in the uncomfortable body sensations is going into the body and trying to find ways to connect in a calm, emotionally neutral or emotionally loving way, which totally transforms the brain chemistry that is released. Mm -hmm. If we're in the body and hating it and resisting it, we get the stress cortisols and the, the brain chemistry yeah. is of the fight, flight, freeze category. If we're in the body, as more of a conscious, self-loving, self-kindness practice, which is where the rock steady process starts, you mm -hmm. get the neurochemicals of compassion and kindness and curiosity and openness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my strategies for moving through panic attack is put the kettle on and just notice how long it lasts. Just, you know, stay with it. How long? Like, oh, this is curious. I wonder what it feels like to have a panic attack. Oh, weird. My heart is pounding really fast. Oh, this feels interesting. Let's see how long this goes like that. Totally. Yeah. And I actually did that when I was in my late 20s before I had any of that psychology training. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until I got the psychology training. I was like, oh, that's exactly what I did. Like, that's that's the yoga response. It's just observe it. <laughs> stay with it. Like, Part of you is going to be freaking out quite rightly. And the other part of you is this wise witness holding space for the freak out. It's like sometimes mm -hmm. no action is the best action. 
That's right. Yeah. Don't just do something. Sit there, right? And and bring full yeah. loving kindness, compassion, and presence to that because that's where the brain can actually start going, hmm, something's not quite right, which is true. Something's not quite right. And then rather mm -hmm. than suppress, deny, distract all of that data, the brain can actually use it and go, okay, I think I'm going to go over here and I'm going to, I'm going to put more effort over here in this relaxation quadrant because that seems to be the best decision right now. Because it's, it's looking yeah. at all of the data, not just the freak out. Yeah, yeah, because when because when when you get locked up a little bit, or I mean, especially with anxiety, and I work a lot with anxiety, so I keep bringing that example up. But if you get locked up in like, oh, what what's going on with my anxiety? I don't like how I feel. This needs to go away. Then that just makes it bigger and bigger. And if you're like, oh, hey, hello, anxiety, I'm noticing you. Oh, what else am I noticing? Right? Oh, I need to go to the store. Or my kids are here and want me to read a book or whatever it is. The brain can like soften up and expand. But anxiety really encourages you to have like this tunnel vision almost i mean that's it's a survival response right it serves a function yeah. if something's yeah. attacking you you want to stare right at them and fight them off or run away yeah. or whatever and, and then we'll, safe. yeah i also wanted to say to listeners there will probably be a real reason for the anxiety like we often judge mm -hmm. ourselves i shouldn't feel this way like i shouldn't be like this mm -hmm. i'm abnormal right. probably not like there probably is something in your life that is not quite right and mm -hmm. I call this, you know, the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual aspects of ourselves at some level, something yeah. will be off and your body is anxiously alerting you to that thing. And unless we stop, pause, notice and feel and this, the body scan gives us a chance to actually calm the storm and look into the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual layers and start to get that understanding. And that's how my clients heal. It's often the mental, mm -hmm. emotional and spiritual parts of our inner world, which are all firing neurons, by the way. Spiritual mm -hmm. being belief, do I believe in myself to heal or do I believe I need Emma to fix me, mm -hmm. right? Do I believe I need that medication to fix me? That's right. a spiritual piece. Am I giving my power away or am I sovereign in and of myself and taking full responsibility for what I'm showing up to in each moment? And anxiety is normal. You know, I'm super anxious. Yeah. I'm a classic hypervigilant personality, which I think is why I'm so good at what I do. I get it. I fully get it. Yeah. But we don't have to be victim to that you know, I can use my hypervigilance and my anxiety as a gift to be mm -hmm. really aware of details. And, and in essence, the more anxious we are, the more we must have self-compassion and self-kindness. You know, that mm -hmm. voice has to be as loud, if not louder than the anxious mm -hmm. voice. So there are gifts every step along the way. And I would say, so step one is observation and noticing, notice what else there is. So step one to dealing with uncomfortable sensations. Is that what you're talking about? Which includes anxiety. That, that is an yeah, uncomfortable yeah. sensation as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but any sensation, we don't even need to label it. Just to welcome and notice it in. Step two sensation. would be how can I support these sensations I'm feeling? Okay. So mm -hmm. take self-responsibility for the fact that your body is screaming for support. Okay. It's not happy. Something's not quite right. I call it the NQRs. Yeah. Yes. And there will be a reason for that. And it could be like a misunderstanding in this moment, your body is telling you, I'm not good enough. I'm completely unworthy. I'm ashamed of who I am. Now you as an adult who's in control of your inner world could notice that and go, oh my God, darling, that is a misunderstanding. Where did you learn that? <laughs> who, what memory comes to you when you think you're not good enough? You're, what are you ashamed of? Like, Have the conversation with yourself and kind of set the story straight. And this is where some of that inner child work and um, deeper self-compassion that's really authentic instead of just like looking in the mirror and oh I love you you know right. you're like we want to go deeper so it's like actually listen to the dialogue get that voice to be heard mm -hmm. and meet it and if part of you is like I'm not worthy um, and I was just thinking earlier because I'm preparing for my book launch next week I had to do all of this just to write a book. It's like, you know, am I worthy of writing a book? Do I have enough knowledge to really offer the world? You got to go yeah. through all of those hurdles before you can even just sit down and write the first word. And if I don't have that voice of compassion and kindness and hope and also humor, it's like, sure, like maybe your book won't be the best book in the world, but somebody might get something out of it. And that's a good enough reason to write it. And you might learn something writing it. Let's give it a go together. No yeah. judgment. Having that dialogue, and that new relationship to yourself where part of you might be vulnerable and young and hurt and afraid and part of you is the older, wiser spirit or soul that can, can kind of parent or be the therapist or be the coach or be the friend 
that dialogue can be game changing because it doesn't matter where Mm -hmm. we are, who we're with, we're never alone. We've always got support. And actually we know what we need because I know my inner voices and I know, I know what my inner selves need to hear. Right. So there's that whole inner process that often gets skipped over. And the reason I say that is because we can't necessarily go, okay, I'm feeling anxious. I don't want to feel that. I just want to feel joy. So I'm just going to go hang out with a friend. We actually end up suppressing the anxiety, trying to bunny hop over to feeling good all the time and never really processing that NQR thing. So we just keep cycling. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I, let, let me make sure I'm understanding this because what you're saying is first like scan and notice, what am I, what am I noticing? And then when, when you start to feel something that's not quite right, which I like that term, when you start to feel something that's not quite right, you say, you know what, instead of saying, oh my gosh, my body's broken. Why do I feel this way? What's the matter with me? You say, oh, I wonder, I wonder if this is kind of a, a, an indicator. I wonder if this anxiety is telling me something's not quite right in my spiritual world or in my emotional or mental world. So it might be like, oh, a, a sense of shame. So, so you notice, oh, I, I'm feeling this discomfort. I wonder if there's something not quite right. And then when you find that, you can start to heal it or address it with this voice of gentleness and this voice of wisdom that you'd be comes a- from the good side. And you'd be amazed at how many points along that little path where you can get tripped up. Uh A couple of those trip ups are wanting to know why. Oh my gosh. I just spent an hour in therapy with someone who's like, why, but why, but why? Right. And it, but I do the same thing too, right? It's so fun to analyze instead of like be with, right? So wanting to know why do I have the tinnitus? Why do I have the anxiety? Why do I feel the shame? Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't actually matter why if you have a really poignant point in time like you know let's say you 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 fell off the monkey bars as a kid and then you were bullied and it was just like a really strong memory you can talk to that and you can help that little part of you heal Mm -hmm. but to be endlessly needing to know a why and why am I diagnosed this way and why did a doctor doctor tell me that why hasn't anyone else healed me and why do I have to do this and why can't somebody else do this for me That is likely to keep you extremely stuck Yep. and to be painful and expensive. So what I shift this to is how. So I'm Mm -hmm. body scanning, I'm noticing, I'm showing up in real time to what neurons are firing. Mm -hmm. Shift the question to if something's not quite right right now, and often we don't know what that is until hindsight, to be honest. In the the moment, often we're not sure what it is Mm -hmm. or why it's there. So the question is, how can I support this feeling right now? I'm feeling something. I'm sensing something. Let's say it's really sharp in my left shoulder. It's mm-hmm. like kind of a painful ache and pain. And it's, it's if I were to describe it, it's like blue and ice and sharp and ooh, it's hideous, right? Mm-hmm. How can I support that? Can I breathe into it? Can I talk to it? Can I ask it? What are you doing here? What do you need from me? What's your message for me, body? What do you to so have the conversation of how can I support you? How mm-hmm. What do you need from me in this moment? And be really open intuitively to what comes up. Mm. And then what I what, what what often happens both in my in myself and with my clients is there's there's a natural evolution of the next feeling, the next conversation. So whatever we started with will often soften and release if we give it time and we breathe through it. You don't have to problem solve it, but more stay with it, support it. You take as long as you take that's a good one for me if I'm feeling really angsty just yep. this way for as long as you want to feel I'm here with you Joey there's no rush it's all perfectly fine and when I hear that message you're allowed to feel this way just take as long as you need I feel like my body goes ah. <laughs> <laughs> you have like these written down on a piece of paper because I feel like if if we all had like a sheet of paper it's like it's like, what do you need right now feeling, you know, it's okay, take as long as you need. And we just like in, in a, an emotional crisis, just like read through that list. <laughs> you yeah. know? I feel like I could use something like that. It's a good idea. I'm sure I have written them down somewhere in many different ways. But it's a nice idea. Sure. But it's also yeah. good. I encourage people to find that conversation that works for you. So I feel like mm-hmm. being highly anxious <laughs> and myself yeah. and also highly judgmental and highly critical and probably perfectionist. I've had to do a lot of work of figuring out how to accept my humanness and Mm -hmm. show up with compassion um, 
in moments when I'm mean to myself and, and you know all of this and so with a lot of practice I've figured out kind of what works for me and that doesn't mean I don't have difficult days I do and you know doing things like launching a book is highly triggering and there are days when I have sad days and just the other day actually it was on the election day for America mm. I had a really sad day I was just feeling like really like blah and I just you could sense all of our collective <laughs> angst a million miles away because we're all just like, what is going on? That's actually what it felt like. And part of me was judging myself and this and that. But I ended up just, I didn't go to yoga. I skipped all of my appointments that day. I just kind of had a day with my little nine month old baby and sipping tea and writing in my journal. And I just had a blah day. And it actually felt really nice to just let myself feel it. Mm -hmm. And that's another key piece is sometimes I think we are feeling collective things. It's not about us. Like we often get very neurotic. Why am I feeling this way? Yeah. Well, maybe we are just feeling extended family angst. Maybe we are feeling community angst. Maybe we are feeling stuff that's beyond us because as a human community on earth, we are connected. Mm -hmm. And are. so really just allowing that kind of mystical piece to become a part of our inner experience without the judgment. Yeah. So as I listen, as I listen to you speak, and I think of someone who's who's listening to this with with a fresh perspective, and they're like, okay, so what I'm supposed to do? I have these uncomfortable sensations of sadness, or these you know uncomfortable emotions, uh, or tinnitus, or vertigo, or dizziness. I'm supposed to notice them and scan, increase my awareness, see what else is there, pay a little bit more attention to the things I want in my life than the things I don't want in my life. Sensor, that's a sensory want. So what desired sensations do I want? Not like, do I want a new race car? Like, I want right, to yeah. Grounded. Okay, so I'm going to focus on sensations that feel grounded, just clarifying that. I'm glad you clarified that because, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not like, <laughs> there's like a whole group of like the secret, right? Like if you just think about money enough, you'll get it. And I'm like, that's maybe not what I'm talking about, just in case that wasn't clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so okay so um okay so what what are the desired sensations and yeah. then practicing kind of just allowing um because like for someone who's, like you who's been practicing this for so long you probably are quite skilled at allowing uncomfortable sensations to come in but for someone who's trying this for the first time they're like what what are you talking about how does one allow oneself to experience something really uncomfortable like tinnitus you know how does yeah. one lean into that without judging it as bad when it's uncomfortable I, I can tell you it's a lot easier than people think because fighting mm. what we feel so basically tinnitus dizziness anxiety sadness whatever they're all unwanted sensations unwanted yeah. sensations and feelings it's all the same same mm -hmm. and basically emotions create sensations and sensations create emotions so they're actually yes, connected and yeah. because they're inside of us we can't run away so it's like if i don't like the dog barking over there i can just remove myself from the dog right that strategy doesn't exist when it's inside of us yep so we end up living in this inner war zone which is totally exhausting it's very mm -hmm. expensive mm -hmm. and what what happens with time when we go through enough inner conflict and pain so I, I have a free body scan that's available on my website and when I've people, listened to it and it's great. <laughs> so when people go there and try that, which is just, it's, it's 10 minutes, you know, for some people that's really challenging and they take three months to be able to actually do that body scan because there's so much inner criticism and resistance. Right. But yeah. stick with it because I think when we're ready, which basically means the pain of living in my body and resisting it outweighs the pain of learning to be non-judgmental and to sit with and not abandon what I'm feeling. It actually becomes easier to stay with the sensations without the fight and go, huh, that's actually not as bad as I thought it would be. It's like it, it becomes less energy consuming to just stay with it and notice and not do anything about it mm -hmm. than to stay with it and judge it and fight it and be in that inner conflict war zone. So I would suggest it's a readiness. And if you guys listening out there are just like, hell no, there is no way I'm closing my eyes and feeling my body. That's totally fine. Just try tomorrow. Like these, the readiness can come. And actually that's with my book. A huge piece is education. And a lot of people will go through my book still feeling a bit skeptical and not ready, but there'll come a time when you're like, you know what? I'm so ready now to explore my neurons and my brain. And mm. I'm tired of waiting for someone else to fix me. I'm ready. Like it, it comes like that. 
and there's yeah. no rush there's no judgment from my part it took me personally four years to do it which is you know a decent amount of time for a young person oh yeah and I was like forever ready. when you're in the middle of something yeah. yeah and I wasn't ready to heal I wanted someone else to fix me and I was really mm -hmm. angry <laughs> that no one else could fix me and of yeah. course and of course, then it got to a point when I was like, you know what, I got the vestibular audiology training, like super elite training. I was with world-class doctors doing internships. No one in the world is a vestibular audiologist anyway. So I had this quirky, very strange <laughs> training. I'm an audiologist who doesn't do hearing tests or hearing aids, like what? Then I had the psychology, I had the whole yoga background, the neuroscience, neuroplasticity. And I realized I was angry at me. I was the professional that I needed. And so I had to show up and become that professional that could heal people like me and mm -hmm. you know in the rest of its history so um yeah i've lost my train of thought now <laughs> oh, this has all been awesome i like i i just I, the inner geek in me is just like diving in and be like oh my gosh let's talk about neuroplasticity like forever you know, <laughs> I know right it's amazing it's 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 very powerful um but yeah, yeah, I think I think what I what I want to say with that, why would I go and feel difficult things in my body? And I think the reason we pause and feel difficult things in our body or hear difficult things in our body and bring a new fresh approach of loving kindness, of openness, of curiosity. Um, I very rarely use the term acceptance because I think it's often twisted into toleration, which is so super yep. not what we want. Yep. So it's this allowing, it's this openness, it's this childlike awe. Um, and, you know, it becomes easier to get curious and to be present without judgment than being in that old familiar pattern of fight, flight, freeze all the time. Mm -hmm. Shifting from that to curiosity and presence can take quite a lot of education and support, but it can be done and it can be, I have clients heal in weeks, if not months, wow. some of them take years, but it doesn't matter, they heal and there is no rush. And if we think about the complex tapestry of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual undertones, you know, some people can sort that out quickly mm -hmm. and feel like they're their best friend and they're on top of the world. Other people take a very long time to discover self-compassion. There is so much in the way of them learning to feel that they can receive that level of deep support and reassurance from themselves. They feel so inadequate and so deeply yeah. hurt and ashamed that self-compassion can take a very long time to cultivate, generate, and receive. But that it makes can still happen. And that you've got to keep believing and um, sorry, never compare yourself to other people. Right. Yeah, that, that makes that makes so much sense to me. And I can feel like I'm just in this beginning journey as far as self-compassion goes. I'm like starting to learn it and starting to practice it. Um, and there are some some areas I, I can do it well and other areas I'm like not quite ready like to do it yet and I'm, I'm in the process of being gentle so and I, I don't mean to share this as a way like oh I have this all figured out but like I did I made a video once when someone who I cared about had passed away mm -hmm. and I was really emotional in the moment and in that moment I was able to be like gentle with those emotions and um, just accept that I was really sad and and move, th move through that and then get back to doing what I was doing. And within a few minutes, like that intensity of emotion had just passed through. Yeah. And it wasn't like a, my, about a lot. Even just being not like he's being mean, like, oh, hey, Emma, this thing that you're doing makes it a little hard for us. And like, for me, be like, no, no, I have to be like the perfect wife. I can't ever like, <laughs> like harm my husband in any way like just like not able yet to accept like that humanness yet <laughs> like still think, working on that one I think it's lifelong I mean having mm -hmm. for me having a baby and publishing a book within a nine month period has been very awakening okay. and I've experienced so many highs like the hormonal highs and bliss of birth and motherhood but mm -hmm. then also the challenges of you know the pressure of my career and being there for my community, feeling an ethical responsibility to write this book. Um, so it's been really confronting and a lot of fears of, you know, am I worthy? Will I get hate mail? Will people hate me? Mm, um, yes. You know, the visibility, all of that. And 
I've had to kind of pause a number of times and just be like, this is an opportunity for me to lean in again and to, mm -hmm. to clear through another layer of that inner gunk that's holding me back from my light and my truth. Yeah. And it takes as long as it takes. And um, yeah, I'm always sharing with my audience my icky bits and my sticky bits and how I support myself through it because that's the important piece. It's not dramatizing the difficult days. It's saying, well, actually, I had this difficult day. I had no idea what it was about. It was really confusing. It was awful. Every part of me felt yuck. This is how I supported myself. And that's actually what my Facebook group is for. We're not allowed to mention symptoms. We're not allowed to ask questions or seek advice or give advice. It's all about this is what I'm feeling. And this is how I'm supporting myself to use neuroplasticity share. It's an amazing group for that reason. It's so specific. I love it. I don't, yeah. yeah. Moderating Facebook groups is not something I'm interested in, but that type of Facebook group, that sounds like bomber. That sounds awesome. It is wonderful. It's an amazing group and, and anyone's free to join it. That's free to the public. It's a closed group, but it's free to join as long as people commit to self-kindness towards themselves mm -hmm. and kindness towards others and non-judgment. It's a, it's an amazing group. Well, cool. I'll make sure and link um, in the description uh, references to your book, your website, your Facebook group. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let's. I have a couple. Do you have time still? I have a couple more questions for you, but if you need to go, that's okay. We can uh, work on it another. Uh, um, I think I'm still going okay. He hasn't. Well, let's just keep going until my husband gives me the wave. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, I would love to hear, I would love to hear just your, briefly your personal story of dealing with vertigo dizziness. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so could you, could you tell us a little bit about how you got into this, how you got so interested in, in treating and healing, you know, vertigo and dizziness? Um, well, when I was younger, I was highly anxious. I grew up with a um, pretty severe asthma condition and only in hindsight now I realize I think from a very young age, like I was 12 months old, mm -hmm. I was blacking out and passing out and like having these near-death experiences. And I think from a really, Whoa. really, really young age, I neurologically embedded the idea that I'm abnormal. I can't even breathe. I'm a complete failure. You know, <laughs> the inadequacy feelings I think set in. And also I, we think that dairy triggered it, but, but mum kept feeding me milk bottles. So it was this idea of, well, um, I'm too sensitive and I'm wrong because I can't cope with normal things that other people can cope with like milk. Yeah. So it's like I in, in, internalize this feeling of being wrong. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, what the reason I share that is because by the time I was 15, I found yoga and that really helped me to feel calm in my body at ease in my body and to help with a lot of that underlying anxiety that I thought was normal, but now I realize I was struggling with. Because on the mm -hmm. outside, I was cheerful, I was popular, I was yep. talented, I was pushing through in a sense, but deep down, I just felt like, you know, a failure, I suppose, inadequate, abnormal. Anyway, so I had all of the recipe for any kind of anxiety disorder. I had that kind of baseline temperament and personality, highly sensitive, you know, quite intelligent, really picking up on details. And I had to protect myself a lot um all the way through my teens anyway I for these reasons I took an interest in psychology I thought I would do a PhD in psychology but did my psychology degree and just found I it was I just didn't find, feel like it gelled with me I didn't like diagnosing people I didn't like the patriarchal system you know I wanted to help people on this journey of discovery I didn't want to diagnose people and give them questionnaires so I kind of got turned off found audiology found it really fascinating learning about the sensory system I love the science it was a beautiful extension yeah. of neuro, um, neuroscience, but then got into audiology and was like, I don't want to sell hearing aids or like <laughs> all day long. So right. I then, my next little thing was, well, the balance organs. And then with my yoga, it was like a really amazing complement of the science and the hardcore with the embodied effort daily experience. In that process of studying <clears throat> the balance organs, I had, I, I randomly experienced benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, BPPV, the most common form of vertigo, and then um, migrinous vertigo, so vestibular migraine, and tinnitus. And this is all in a four-year period. And I was working with elite doctors and, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, ear, nose and throat surgeons, neurologists, physical therapists, you name it. And, you know, it's funny, like, if there's no medical reason, they just, like, go live with it, nothing we can do. And I was just like, what? And with my yoga background, I'm like, I was seeing the link with the anxiety. 
I was feeling it. And, um, you know, I, I struggled with it, but I hid it. You know, I was so good at hiding what I was feeling by that time. I was in my mid 20s to late 20s. Um, but then I started to play with my sounds and play with my dizziness and notice if I could rev them up and aggravate them and notice if I could calm them and reduce them down, which of course I could. So I couldn't get rid of it yet, but I was starting to notice how I could manipulate them and I could create them. Mm -hmm. And so then of course I started to really trial and error strategies and techniques and methods that could work using neuroscience, neuroplasticity and my understanding of the sensory world and my yoga background. And anyway, I completely healed ended up leaving the university where I was working and seeing clients and seeing thousands of people feeling helpless, hopeless, powerless, over-medicated, misunderstood. And I felt ethically responsible to start providing alternative treatment models and methods and doing research. So I started Seeking Balance, which is my business, seekingbalance.com.au. I built um, new methods to help people look at the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual aspects of their healing. And I created educational resources, which is now the Rocksteady online program, which is six modules over 12 weeks, but you keep it for life. Collected a lot of data. We followed 146 people, I think, through an 18 month period. And we saw statistically significant improvements in their symptomatology. It was just mind blowing highly significant seeing people getting better healing feeling like a complete change in their perspective yeah. and their symptoms and the reason i share that is because just because i heal doesn't mean other people can right you, you, right yeah but i'm not a scientific experiment that's right beyond exhibit a so yeah. i had conviction i knew it could work because it had worked for me but did i know if my resources and educational programs would help others no i was skeptical and that was the hypothesis so we had to test the hypothesis does it work Turns out it was getting better results than face-to-face -face therapy because there's a lot of dead time in therapy. Like clients uh -huh. go away on their own for a week, two or a month and they forget their exercises. They don't know what to do. They misunderstand things. Whereas with an online program, they can watch it on repeat. You know, they can click it at 3 a.m. There's support resources, no matter what they're feeling on any given day, they can choose what they need in that moment. It's just, it's so much more robust. And then there's also the, the live group calls and peer group calls where they can connect to others and hear questions and go through an online therapy process yeah. on, on replay. And um, anyway, so yeah, that, like I said earlier, we see significant improvements and improvements are happening regardless of age, whether they're 20 or 80, doesn't matter, regardless of gender, regardless of diagnoses or lack of diagnoses. So for you people out there who've never had a diagnosis and it's just killing you, as long as you have medical clearance, that's all we need. And my book covers that. Medical clearance means you're not dying and you can move towards neuroplasticity for healing. The doctors are expert in medical clearance, not always so great at diagnosis. So regardless of diagnosis, you can see improvements. And regardless of time since onset of symptoms, it doesn't matter if you got your symptoms six months ago or 30 years ago. Neuroplasticity is still something you can use and employ to adapt and reverse the condition. I love it. I think I think what you're doing is incredible. I think the world needs you. Can you tell us a little bit about the book you wrote? Yeah, yeah, my book. Well, my book is actually really a summary of that process. You know, I share mm -hmm. some of my, I share some of my personal journey, um, including going through that sad uh, time of deep sadness, panic attack. Um, I talk about my really unique background and why people often say, Joey, why is no one telling you about neuroplasticity? Why are you the only one talking about neuroplasticity? Like, you know, are you a scam? And I talk about how, well, actually, there is no training for how to heal with neuroplasticity in the, in the medical system, in the audiology system, in the physical therapy system. We're taught from like a, a perspective of like you, you pump iron at the gym, you repeat a physical exercise, like that is not actually neuroplasticity, that's muscle building. And there is some neuroplasticity involved, but integrative holistic neuroplasticity is more than physical exercises. It's about the mental, emotional, spiritual realms. You know, what are my thought, what thought patterns am I seeing? What emotional loops and emotional regulation do I need to work on? And spiritually, what do I believe in? Who do I believe in? Do I believe in my body's capacity to heal? These are not something anyone is trained in. And so I was lucky enough to have this eclectic training that included the old ancient Eastern yogic background and self-inquiry and self-study and observation, as well as my psychology, acceptance, acceptance, commitment therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, neuroscience and vestibular audiology. I kind of had the blend of East and West. And 
my intention in writing this book is actually to get this message out to doctors and audiologists and psychologists and physical therapists, etc. Um, because we need to be having this conversation that we don't need a cure. Okay, that's not the right conversation. We need to teach people how to change their brain, why the brain can get stuck, why they can be stuck with symptoms for life. Absolutely, you can be stuck for life if you're never taught how to reverse it or how to unlock it, how to break the, the symptom loop. So my book really is a conversation starter. I'm also hoping that it will inspire more research and you know, a really robust global conversation for these people who are tragically mm -hmm. being overlooked, over-medicated, misinformed, mm -hmm. And they're depleting themselves. They're exhausted. They're spending way too much money on all these like out there therapies that are not really specific enough for their personal condition. I would call them more generic prescriptive therapies or just random, <laughs> you know, some therapies are pretty random. Um, yeah. I'm hoping my book kind of dispels um, some of the myths, helps people clarify what they choose and why for themselves. My book doesn't tell you what to do, but it teaches you how to figure out healing for yourself. If you do have chronic dizziness, like persistent, post, um, persistent postural perceptual dizziness or any vestibular condition or tinnitus, I want you to have hope. I want you to know you can reverse it. You can return to normal. Even if you have an intermittent condition like many years or something um, with huge amount of uncertainty, you can learn to move through the uncertainty and have really great results to return to normal between incidences. So I think it's important people don't feel hopeless and helpless. There's a lot you can do to support yourself, support your body. This book is the game changer. It's the conversation starter. And I've been saying to my community, don't only just buy a copy for yourself, buy a copy for your entire medical team, your entire support team, your psychologist, your yoga teacher, give it to everyone so that then they know how to support you. Mm -hmm. I love it. I've, I've skimmed through your book. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but everything I've read is just resonating with me. Like people need to understand this in this context of like how to stop fighting your body and how to listen to your inner wisdom and how to believe in your ability to create change within yourself and within your body and within, I mean, especially reversing those cycles of being so stuck. Yeah. And if we only speak with doctors, they have so many, they have so many skills within their specialty. Yeah. But if, that, if we think that's the only tool we can reach out to, yeah. then we can feel really stuck. So I, it, I, I, yeah, I think it's great. And it's also really important to realize like this book is actually what the doctors are telling us. Like a lot of the, the statements the doctors say about don't worry about it or, you know, it should return to normal. Like it'll, like, it'll be fine. Or, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know why you're not healing. Like, let's just try this drug. Like a lot of what they're saying is really accurate it's just that the doctors don't necessarily know how to educate you to change your neurons. So they're using drugs to experiment. That's their expertise. If you don't want to try drugs or you've tried drugs and it hasn't worked for you, there are other options. It's just that the doctors are more likely to send you to this book than teach you how to do it. So again, it's about knowing that this book actually is fully complementary of the medical model. Yeah, um, yeah. And a lot of the doctors reading this book are like, fantastic. This is a great resource to reinforce. Yeah what I want to tell my clients, but I've only got 15 minutes and this is a whole book that gives them that time to understand it and, and much more deeply. And yeah, fact, it, breaks, it breaks down these skills, right? So the doctor might say, oh, don't worry about it. Well, and what you're saying is, that? oh, hey, there, there's an active process, a skill set you can learn. I'm going to break it down into 20 little steps about how to be non-judgmental and how to gain greater awareness of your sensations and how da, 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 right? And I'll break these steps down into little baby steps. So I think, I think it's really valuable. I'm so glad, so glad you challenged your own, you know, sense of... <laughs> Like, oh, I don't know if I should put myself out there and did it anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm really, really pleased. In fact, it's just this week, or maybe yesterday, where I started mm -hmm. to kind of, kind of have this little inner voice inside of me going, I'm kind of proud of myself. Yeah. I've done it. Like, this was a really <laughs> big effort. I remember when my baby was seven weeks old, just tiny oh. little football, and I <laughs> selected my publisher and click, click go on publishing this book. And I had this <laughs> tiny little baby. And I knew mm -hmm. it would be ready for release by October, November. And we embarked on that journey and we got there. So awesome. Yeah. That's so great. Um, that is great. I only have one other question for you. Um, are you familiar with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Yes. Did you know that one of the bad guys, the henchman, his name is Rocksteady? 
Oh, I totally forgot that. That's awesome. I was looking to see if I had if I had the character. I have his buddy Beep Bop, but I don't have the I don't have the rock steady character. I just thought that was funny. I it's loved him so awesome. when I was a kid. <laughs> and you know what? Like, am I allowed to say badass? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I feel like part of healing is like we have to be a little bit badass because yeah. a lot of being stuck in the sickness and the abnormality and the not good enoughs and the symptomatology is these really old familiar neural highways and they feel comfortable because they're familiar even though we don't like them we keep going back to them because it's like well i know this right mm -hmm. and so we have to have a bit of rock steady badass in us to be like uh -uh, i'm going to try this old this new familiar rocky neural pathway that i haven't used in like 15 years and it's my peaceful pathway and i don't even know if it's real like i'm skeptical but i'm going to try it anyway even though it's unfamiliar and it's awkward mm -hmm. and it feels a bit not quite right at first i'm going to be a little badass and i'm going to start going off the beaten track and building new neural pathways like you need a little bit of that teenage mutant ninja turtle attitude to help get out of the old rut and be courageous to explore the new neural pathways which invariably feel a bit weird in the beginning until we automate them Oh, it takes so much courage, huh? Like to, to challenge um, like self-loathing with self-compassion. That's yeah. like such an uncomfortable, weird, strange thing to do. And I think it does. It takes some badassery to do it. Yeah. <laughs> or like to challenge like self-victimhood or brokenness or this idea that there's nothing I can do or yeah. whatever our old patterns are. Um, and yeah, I love it. I love that you've broken it down just into little, yeah. just, just like break it down into very actionable steps. So thank you it's, so much. It's really such a pleasure. Such a pleasure to meet you, Emma. So thank you for all the work you do too in your incredible YouTube channel. I will be sharing that with my people too. Well, cool. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time. And again, if if any of you guys want to learn more, please check out the links in the description. I've checked out her website. There is um, a ton of free resources on there, including what is it a seven day program that you just email out? Is that what it is? Uh, the seven day programs actually in, in America, it's about $70. It's $100 Australian because I'm an Australian company but the yeah. free resources are totally abundant there's a starter kit that's free and there's okay. free live um replays and like honestly some people heal with just the free stuff definitely mm -hmm. try out the free stuff and go there and then if you want more community and you want more customized skills i have paid programs to nurture people through that relationship with themselves and then yeah. of course the book the book will be an amazing resource which is available now on amazon it's 18 dollars and that awesome. comes with a free program, a free Rocksteady workbook comes with the book. So that's a neat little surprise. That's awesome. Well, yeah, your website's just full of resources. So such a great um, thing yeah. to put out there for people. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Hopefully we can talk again um, sometime soon. Yeah, totally. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Take care. Bye for now. Okay. so. I